Aloha, and welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'i. And our guest this afternoon is none other than the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Hawaii, Josh Green. He has been with us as a regular guest, really, because of his intensive involvement in the coronavirus uh, pandemic that uh, we are all having to go through. And there's no better person, really, than a state official who happens to also be a doctor to tell us what's happening in that whole arena. The title of this particular show is When Will This Lifestyle End? And hopefully we'll start to get a sense of that over the course of the next half an hour or so. So, so folks, join me in welcoming the Lieutenant Governor, Josh Green. Hi, Josh. How's the Lieutenant Governor? How are you? Governor, you look, uh, you're at home today, right? And uh, doing yes. what we all hope everybody is doing, which is uh, staying at home. Except um, I'm at the studio, and um, one of the few times that uh, we can come in here. But anyway, oh, where do we start? It's been like forever. How long, if you, I don't want to put you on a spot, but how long has the shutdown been in effect? About approximately, about three weeks, four weeks? Well. It feels like forever. The mandatory 14-day uh, quarantine for all travelers started on March 26th. So actually, it's been only the last week of March, then the month of April, and the first few days of May. But it feels like an incredibly long time because people are making such amazing sacrifices. But, uh, Governor, it is paying off. And the, uh, the truth is that we had to do this. The, the curve has flattened completely. We've now had single-digit growth in the number of cases for more than two weeks. We only had one new case today, taking us to 621. Just and one new case fatality. today? That's yes, fantastic. just one case. Yep, one case today, two yesterday, and one the two days before. So just five cases in the last five days. And that is a, uh, that's an amazing thing. Is that on Oahu or statewide? Do you know? Uh, it was statewide. In fact, there was no cases on Oahu today. Really, quite something. Well, no cases on Oahu. That's a that's a good sign. That's a real positive sign. So yes, uh, the virus is burning out for sure. Well, uh, what about uh, the su supplies and tests and the rest of the all of the other u uh, issues that were avail uh, were uh, so troublesome just a week or so ago. Well, I'm, I'm, I really am glad you asked. So our supplies have been good. We've been getting pallets of supplies in that what's called PPE, personal protective equipment. So we now have enough to function in our hospitals. Also, our hospital capacity has remained good. We're only using 13% of our ventilators and only 42% of our intensive care units. And to a doc like me, that matters most because that means we can keep people alive. Also, we've now run 33,537 tests and we can run up to 3,000 tests per day here in the state if we have to. So we have the capacity to address the crisis. And unlike any other state in the country, we've been able to really, really flatten it. Uh, so much so that now what I like to say is the viral load is almost zero in Hawaii, which will enable us to start uh, opening things up again. You know, um, Lieutenant Governor, uh, as part of the, 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 your, the strategy, we, what what uh, I, I noticed was to get people to, um, g you know, get used to the idea of, um, uh, how do I say it, of using masks and using the equipment and, and so forth. And it seems to have created a, a new lifestyle in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii people have adopted, adapted very well to this uh, crisis. I, I, I'm actually kind of proud. Uh, am I speaking out of term or is this something that's, uh, you know, that's unique to Hawaii and very, uh, maybe a few other places in the country, but especially Hawaii. It seems like uh, people have just complied for the most part. Yes. Well, it was only 
it was only March 31st that I asked people to start wearing masks every time they left home. And that was echoed, of course, by some of the mayors and the governor. And it seems like so long ago, one of the things people have been interested in is this, this funny whiteboard exercise my team does every day. And we repeat things intentionally on that whiteboard because it's, it is a matter of changing standards, changing expectations, and getting used to uh, a crisis that is quite dangerous, actually. But because people have responded so well to the crisis and so, um, so like we would hope in one Ohana, it really means that we've been able to keep people alive. Other states have had deaths like in their nursing homes and other facility, big outbreaks in their, nurse, in their uh, homeless camps. We haven't had those things because people have been so um, cooperative. And I really want to give a shout out to all of your listeners and everybody across the state of Hawaii. You've done something special and we will make sure that your sacrifices do not go unrewarded. You will be rewarded for this because people, people will view Hawaii as the safest place in the world to travel to over time. Well, that's, that's terrific. You know, and I, I wanted to, what are the stats? I mean, how, what's the total number of cases in Hawaii and, uh, you know, all of that? And how do we compare to the rest of the country? Uh, let me share them with you. So we have a very small number. Our total number is 621. And of those 621, eight, uh, 88%, 88%, which is 544 people have already fully recovered. So just 12% of our, of our people that got positive, became positive, still have the virus. By also, the way, if you recover, can you get the virus again? We, we don't believe so, although there's, mixed, there's been mixed science on that. It's always possible that, <coughs> excuse me, that somebody who uh, was felt to have recovered still had a small amount of virus in them and then had another positive test in the future. So we're still learning about this virus. If you recall, the virus only started in late December of 2019, which is, is only four, like four full months ago. So scientists are racing ahead right now all across the globe to figure out what really goes on with this virus. So, okay, so we have a, about a little over 600 cases. 88% of the people have um, been uh, cured, I guess, or, or gotten well. Yes. Gotten uh, I don't well. know the term to use. But, uh, and beyond that, only 1.2 out of 100,000 people have perished, which is the lowest rate in the world, actually. And we're very similar to a couple other places, Wyoming and Alaska, where they, of course, have far fewer people. It's very rural. So we're the only place in the world, not wood, that has a city, a significant city, that was able to keep um, the death rate this low. And that is testament to people and our healthcare providers and first responders. Oh, that's the, so I, I want to ask you this question because I've heard it uh, stated a number of times and I, I did want some verification. And that is that actually we have the lowest percentage or the, first of all, the lowest number of uh, cases in the country for, you know, on a per capita basis and also the lowest number of fatalities. Uh, in yes. the country on a per capita basis. Is that pretty much correct? That's, that's accurate. That's exactly correct. It's close. The, the mortality rate is very similar in Wyoming, Montana, and South Dakota to Hawaii. But those places have vast, vast underpopulated areas. We, of course, have a big city here in Honolulu. So it's really something. People, people don't realize what, what a feat they have pulled off by keeping our mortality rate low. And I'm glad because when you look across the dinner table at night, if you were in New York City or some other big city, it's very likely you'd be looking across the table at someone who caught COVID and would be in trouble. Whereas in Hawaii, we don't have that. Very, very few cases. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and, and I guess that's a tribute to the well, the good people of Hawaii, uh, and also all uh, the uh, makes us begin to understand and appreciate all of the actions that were taken by the state and county governments to to help us uh, achieve those kinds of results. Um, what about 
the fact that right across the country now, and it's seeping into Hawaii, there are people who are walking, going around saying that the economy is more important in a I don't know if they're actually saying that in Hawaii, but I've heard that said in other places on the country, uh, on the newsreels, that the economy is more important than the the mortality uh, of the rate of uh, the people. Well, you know, the doctor and me, I shake my head at that because we will recover economically for sure. And I know people are hurting. Gov. I mean, you, you, you've been there when we've had to go through recessions and you've had hard times when you were governor and you, you pulled us through miraculously, but we will get through this. And Hawaii with our low rates will be a very serious attraction to the rest of the world. But if we had allowed COVID to roll over us like it did in some other places like Spain or New York City, we would have had 4,900 deaths, 4,900 wow. deaths. Can you imagine that? And that would have been by April 17th. So we, we've done the analytics. We know that to be true because we know what our case rate would have been and how many people die of the disease. So that's not something that a small state could have ever recovered from. So I hope that I respect protesters and I don't, you know, I definitely am a, a freedom of speech type guy, but I hope that people will really, instead of just um, making light of the sacrifices that people are making, I hope that they will instead realize that life is actually on the line. And that's why I'm leading this the way I am and why the governor's making decisions the way he is. Now, what's the likelihood that there might be a resurgence of the uh, virus in places that, um, you know, get carried away and prematurely? Well, we could, if, if we're not careful about uh, the, re, uh, the restart to tourism, if we're not careful about that, we would run the risk of having a heavy surge. So I'm proposing some measures that will keep us safer. For instance, I'm recommending very strongly that we have everyone get a test within 72 hours of, of traveling to Hawaii. And if they have that negative test, it will greatly reduce the possibility that we will get a surge of COVID-19. And it will also make for a very safe place to visit and holiday if people are coming from California or New York or anywhere. So. We can avoid that, and we can certainly keep it to a minimum, but I'm having our analytics experts check exactly what it would look like, and I have some pretty amazing graphs to show that if we don't test or, or we don't take precautions, we will see terrible surges of COVID-19, and all of this sacrifice will be for nothing. So I'm Is not it worse when it reoccurs, or is it just as bad? You know, like sometimes when, the, when an epidemic or something like that happens, the reoccurrence is, is uh, often, uh, at least I've been told, the reoccurrence is often worse than the initial outbreak. Is that some truth well, in our, to that? In our case, it would be because we've so successfully kept the curve flat. I mean, we really kept it flat. If we had a big surge um, from tourism, for let me give you an example. If we had 20,000 um, tourists start returning per day, or even less than that, if we just had 20%, of our tourist, uh, tourist rate per day, we would see in the course of three months over 2,000 cases in the hospital. Just wow. by, yeah, and, and that is without testing. Now, if we test people before they come in, we will see no surge because we'll be able to keep the number of people at a very small minimum that are positive in the state. And so that's the kind of calculation that I make daily to make sure that we're ready uh, for anything when we're ready to bring tourism back, which obviously will have to happen sooner. We are going to have to take a short break, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and, and part of this very interesting conversation, and we will be right back. Aloha, my name is Duration. I'm the host of Finding a Future here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here every other Tuesday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Here on this show, um, I cover issues around sustainability, um, you know, global issues that matter for young people, for future generations, and other social justice issues. So please join us. It's live streamed on Think Tech Hawaii and also uploaded on YouTube.
Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe and our guest, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Hawaii, Josh Green. We were right in the middle of a very important conversation about what may, what uh, might be some of the strategies to get us back to normalcy, or get us out of this lifestyle back to some. I want to see the Hawaii I grew up with, when you're not afraid to walk over and hug somebody that you've known your whole life. And nowadays, we, we don't even want to bump elbows, it seems. So tell me, what are some of the thoughts? You just talk, came up with your recommendation about having people, um, you know, get tested when the, when the tourists come in. Now, how, how does that all work? I, you know, well, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No problem at all. Thank you, Governor. So the way it would work would be simply before uh, people came to Hawaii, when they scheduled their trip, they would go see their healthcare provider, nurse pr practitioner or doctor, and they would just get a basic test. And that test would be done within three days of their travel so that we knew that they were negative and therefore very unlikely to be uh, Infectious. And they would have like a card or some kind of certification. I am. Yes, I've even recommended that we uh, enter into a partnership with some of the national folks, uh, whether that's uh, Longs or um, their, you know the the other minute clinics across the country. And if they they were to do those tests, uh, CVS and other pharmacies, they have a database that we could partner on. So it could be done very simply. We certainly could have a certificate that people. Guys, we certainly could have a certificate that we could have uh, from the Department of Health, and that certificate would be more than enough to uh, decrease our concern that anyone hadn't been tested. And it's it's not really a matter of being perfect; it's a matter of being very good to keep the virus. Oh, down that's so that's that's a great uh, analogy. By the way, we have a listener question, and I think it's uh, directed to me, uh, but. Uh, uh, you know, I'm the host, so I, I get to ask questions. So I'm going to pass this question over to you. And it um, it says, uh, if if you, would you allow businesses to go back to work at, at where we are at the moment? Uh, yes, I, I actually would. I would allow medium, and I think it's coming in the next few days, medium risk businesses, which is to say businesses where they're able to, on some level, socially distance, just the basic minimum, I would think that that's safe now. We have a very low viral load here in the state, and that would be okay. The so businesses I, like like what? Uh, like uh, whole, wholesalers, retailers, manufacturers, places yes. like that? Anyone that can do a modicum of social distancing, meaning keep their numbers semi-diminished uh, over time, like only let a few customers come in at a time, take two turns, and keeping six feet apart uh, more often than not, that's sufficient. So retailers, uh, shops at the mall, offices, all of those things now, in my opinion, are safe enough. And the governor will make um, some additional announcements, I'm sure, this week on this on this subject. The, the goal really is to get everybody back to work that we possibly can before opening tourism up. So we reacclimate. I know that that will still leave significant numbers unemployed, but we will obviously honor unemployment and get everyone their checks, even if we have to give them back checks. So that should sustain people. But getting the, the mid-level businesses and medium risk businesses open in the next two weeks is very important. And all of us uh, around the Gov and others are pushing hard for that. So before Memorial Day, I'm hopeful that much of the business community will be back operational. And, and uh, I'm assuming that uh, administration is spending time working with the airlines to, and the yep. uh, hotels and the rest of it. You know, um, let me, <laughs> this is going to sound, uh, going to sound a little bit uh, different, but frankly, one, <laughs> you, in my opinion, one of the most essential businesses in, uh, that's out there, which I didn't, I wouldn't have thought so in the beginning of the crisis is uh, a place where I can get my hair cut, you know, yes. and I brought that up. I was at home. I said, you know, you, uh, with some, I said, I, I think what I would like is a haircut. 
Actually, I was up at the governor's office when I mentioned that, uh, of, of, with my mask, uh, of course. And I said, hey, you know, what we ought to open up is the place where we can get a haircut. And he, they laughed, and they said, and uh, somebody to hairdress the, the ladies. And I said, yeah. And uh, well, I, when, are, when are businesses I, like that going to get a shot at reopening? Well, Look, I've seen pictures of you looking all sexy with your sideburns and your mop. <laughs> well, look at this. I look like I, you know, I don't know what I do with this. I need a haircut. I, I, I'm not. No, I'm, back to 30 years ago, I would have not minded at all. But you I'm know, in other words, the smaller mom and pop businesses. When do we start to really open them up? I think that those businesses will be able to open in early June. That's my hope. I. Uh, the, there's an interesting quirk about hairdressers, and that is that they have to spend, you know, 30 minutes directly uh, right right over a person. And that is the kind of the definition of high risk, which is in close contact with somebody because they obviously have to be right on top to do the haircutting. And that makes it a challenge. And I'm, I feel badly because I love going to my hair cutter. I've had my, one of my staff has been buzz cutting my hair and I really appreciate Jeremy, but I, you know, I feel badly when I don't get to give some business to our local friends at small businesses. So that will come back soon too. And if we continue to have virus loads and virus counts this low, there will be no excuse not to open everything. So we're getting there really fast, Gov. Now, now what about uh, the different islands appear to have different rates? Uh, for example, I, I've been told that Kauai. Uh, hasn't had uh, very many, if any, new cases in a, quite a while. And it would seem that in a place like that, you could move a little faster uh, to reopen yeah. businesses than uh, in somewhere else. Yeah, uh, I, I gotta, I've got to give a shout out to Mayor Kawakami. He's done a very excellent job. Uh, they have not had a case, I don't believe, in three weeks. And there have been no cases, for instance, on Lanai either. Another shout out to Mayor Victorino in that sense. And each place has its own challenges. Of course, there'd be very few cases on Big Island had it not been for that one cluster at the McDonald's, which was problematic. So each and all the mayors have done something good. Mayor Caldwell has done very good work to try to help the homeless community. So uh, each are doing some good work. But some places will open a little sooner than others because of that. And I've been in the meetings with the governor where he's been able to uh, give flexibility to each of the mayors. There is the question of confusion for people, however, and we're, we're trying to be mindful that when we open, say, beach parks in one area, that people don't get the idea that all of them are open. Or if we get the idea that a certain type of restaurant is open, say, on Kauai, where they're not having any cases, we don't want people to suddenly flock to all the restaurants just a little bit before we're ready here on Oahu. So. There's some nuance to it, and, and I'm sure that you, having experienced being governor for eight years, you you recall very clearly, I'm sure, how quickly things can get out of control if, if people get the wrong idea. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, I, you know, what are the criteria, for example, on the beaches that need to be? I Just to see where we were, I drove... Um, I drove out around the Hawaii Kai area and, and to just take a look. I, we didn't stop anywhere. We just, my wife and I just went down and just to see how people were, were, were you know, how people were getting along. And what I noticed was that, um, uh, for example, the blowhole area out there just before you get to uh, Sandy Beach was closed. But Sandy Beach itself was open. I mean, how, how, what? Am I asking something that uh, I should have saved for, for, for the mayor, or is this something you can help us with? What makes, what makes a place different? Well, the main premise is that uh, at beaches right now, people can go and exercise. So if there is capacity to exercise, like there's a large stretch of actual beach or a beach park, then it's open for exercise. But for places that are kind of um, like uh, landmarks, that you really, you're not exercising there, but simply people would be gathering as if they were, you know. Oh, okay, I got it. Yeah. yeah, so that's the real reason. And so we're, we're also going to have the same standard for state parks and all of the parks. We want to keep people moving. We're not yet ready to go to the next level where we'll allow 
I would guess up to 10 people again to congregate and have a picnic or what have you. That's coming. And when we are able to take us ourselves down to the next day for knots, which is very soon, certainly by June 1st, that's when we'll begin to restore that kind of behavior. And I heard so that, that uh, the summertime is, is the, is the time where uh, the viruses don't like the warm weather. I mean, the coronavirus. Is that a factor in this decision-making process? It is. I commissioned a small study to make sure that that was correct, and it is. Once the temperatures reach 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the virus uh, plummets. And the reason for that, we believe, is because droplets, which is how this is spread, droplets are sneezing and coughing and breathing, dry up extremely quickly at those temperatures. And so that's why I've never been too, too prickly about people being on the beaches, because the beaches of all places will tend to be safer. Please, everyone, take that with a grain of salt. I don't want people to congregate until the governor gives the order. Uh, but honestly, beaches are much safer than many other well, places. Well, I don't think so, because if you're in the water and you're being washed off and the like of it, uh, yeah, I can see where it would be safe. And that's really the, the genesis of the question, which I can see where it would be safer in a way to be on Sandy Beach than to be standing around the blowhole. You know, Absolutely. but... I, you know, I, I'm really grateful for all the work that all the the responders, first responders are doing uh, doing this crisis. And I do notice that we, we didn't get, a, we were unfortunately running out of time, but I did want to, I did notice that certain subgroups seem to be having more of the virus than others. And one particular group uh, uh, would be Native Hawaiians. And is that something that you could give us a little insight to in, in about 20 seconds? Yes, uh, the Pacific Islander community in general has had much higher rates of infection. And, and that's very likely because we have much larger extended families living together. So everyone just be careful, we'll get through this in the next few weeks and we'll restore the economy. But I'm so grateful to you, Governor, for including me in the dialogue. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you for all the work you're doing. I know that you're a strong proponent of us sensibly reopening the economy, and I want to thank you for that as well, as being the stalwart that you are to make sure that the, the virus itself uh, doesn't really affect our people badly. So thank you, and we'll all to our listeners, we'll see you again in two weeks.